I'm Ado Van Balkum and welcome to Postmortem here on screen. I'm wearing my cheesy science fiction tie because tonight we've got the cheesy science fiction thriller Mandroid from Full Moon Entertainment. You'll remember them as the people who brought us the Puppet Master series. Mandroid is all about a high-tech robot that's controlled by a VR headset. There's two scientists in the movie, one evil and one good, and they both struggle for control of both the Mandroid and the element that powers it, called Supercon. Supercon is this wonder element that can do just about everything from power the Mandroid unit to make people invisible. As you can see, there's all sorts of sf elements to this film, so I brought along a friend of mine, Canadian science fiction writer Robert J. Sawyer, to help make sense of it all. Welcome, Rob. Hey, Ado. Uh, let's start with the Mandroid itself. What is it about uh, science and science fiction that always seems to want to make a machine that is in man's image, but a little bit more than a man, and superior in many ways. You know, the in man's image comes from a lot of scientists are geeks, let's face it. They're the 98 pound weakling, or they're the big fat guy who never got picked in, uh, in sports. And they go into science because really they're trying to do godlike things. The godlike thing they want to do is compensate for what their own shortcomings. They want to be the big strong guy. They want to be the super endurable guy. And they do this all the time, not just in science fiction or horror, but I think there's a real life element to this as well. Well, there's a certainly uh, angry scientists in this one. They all want to have control and have the power. But uh, as far as an original story goes, uh, I was talking to you uh, about this before and you're telling me that the story in uh, many elements of it in Mandroid uh, have been lifted uh, unofficially of course from a very famous science fiction story. We use the word homage oh, yes. when we're referring homage, to that process. Yes. Roger Zelazny, great great science fiction writer, recently deceased, wrote a story in the 70s called Home is the Hangman. And the Hangman was this robot figure, robot body, that was controlled just as the Mandroid is, by virtual reality goggles and, and uh, levers and switches that make him work. And there's this recurring theme in science fiction and horror that if you put some mask on or put something acting on your behalf, like the Mandroid or like the Hangman, you've got a little immunity from whatever the moral consequences are of what you're doing. Certainly in Home is the Hangman, they start out having all kinds of fun with their robot and it ends up killing somebody. And then there's, of course, well, I didn't really kill anybody. It's all fun and games until someone loses an eye. That's exactly right. All right. <laughs> so it's not an original story, but it's, well, it doesn't improve on the original either. Yeah. So sit back, relax, and watch a real cheesy science fiction movie, and science creates something that's a little bit more than a man. Mandroid was filmed in Bucharest, Romania, which is good since the movie took place in Eastern Europe. Apparently that's a whole country, Eastern Europe. Anyway, along with questionable science and pretty wacky science at that, there's the obligatory mad scientist in this movie. And the scientist wants Supercon and Mandroid for use as weapons. Will these scientists ever learn? To answer that question, we have with us award-winning Canadian science fiction writer, Robert J. Sawyer. I want to ask Rob about mad scientists. Have they been unfairly portrayed in films, or are they getting their just rewards? You know, I'd like to say that it's just a filmic cliche, the mad scientist, but Osama bin Laden had no trouble at all finding people who would work on chemical weapons for him, people who would work on nuclear weapons for him. When the United States decided to build a nuclear bomb, they had no trouble getting scientists to do it. Science without a conscience is mad science, and I think there really is uh, a real history of this. Not necessarily the scientist who goes crackers, but the scientist who is doing these things that just seem morally abhorrent to everybody around them. Now, you write about scientists all the, sure. all the time, and very well, I might add. Thank you. And uh, you must have a favorite movie scientist, a, a scientist that uh, strikes the balance between the mad scientist and the actual good scientist who's trying to improve the lot of mankind. Hammer Films is famous for their library of horror films. They made a couple of good science fiction films. There's one called Five Million Years to Earth. That's North American title. In Europe, it was Quatermass and the Pit. And the title character, Professor Bernard Quatermass, is my favorite fictional scientist of all time. He himself is a pretty sane guy, but the world around him is lunacy of alien invasions, of demonic possessions. And he's trying to deal with this 
as a rational man. I think the, the, the portrayal is brilliant, and that's a film that I recommend highly, Five Million Years to Earth. So, not every scientist in horror and science fiction films is mad, just most of them. That's the lowdown about mad scientists from a very sane science fiction writer, Robert J. Sawyer. I'm Ado Van Belton. Good night and pleasant dreams. So, I don't think you know crap, bugger. <laughs> I do, too. <laughs> All right. No, I'll tell you. That film was author, a piece of garbage, too. <laughs> the author of Crater Mass in the Pit won the uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. That's right, Nigel Neal. Nigel, Nigel Neal, great writer. I couldn't remember the name. Hi. I'm Ado Van Belkin, and welcome to Postmortem here on Scream. Well, if you thought Mandroid was a bit on the cheesy side, wait till you see tonight's film, Invisible, The Chronicles of Benjamin Knight. Believe it or not, this one is a sequel to Mandroid. It's got all the elements of the first one, a mad scientist, the Mandroid itself, and an invisible hero, a military regime, an all-powerful element called Supercon, and a plot that mixes up all these things like a garden salad. Now, so many subjects and so little time to talk with our guest here, science fiction writer, Robert J. Sawyer. I want to ask you about invisibility, because that's the title of the film. What is it about invisibility that pops up so much in science fiction and in uh, science fiction films? Sure, and it is one of the original science fiction ideas. It goes right back to H.G. Wells and the Invisible Man. Two centuries ago now we're talking. Uh, invisibility is the ultimate anonymity. Nobody can see you, so nobody can say, oh, Edo was there. He's the guy who did that. You're absolutely undetectable if you're invisible. I'm detecting a theme here with the mandroid uh, and now the invisibility. The whole idea that you can distance yourself yourself from responsibility for your actions. It's, yeah, that's the definition of a mad scientist. The other thing about invisibility is most invisibility, certainly going right back to Wells, is that you're naked. It's kind of both voyeurism and exhibitionism at the same time. You can sneak into the girls change room at summer camp and you're standing there completely naked while you're doing that, you see. So it, it has, there's, a, there's like in many things, like in vampires, there's a sexual connotation to the appeal of invisibility as a theme. Unfortunately, the hero in this film does not seek sneak into the girls' change room. Be a better film. <laughs> but he does, yes it would. It would improve the film dramatically. But he does use his invisibility to fight the bad guys, which I guess is as good. It, uh, it's not as good as sneaking into the girls' change room, but it's okay anyway. Uh, I want to ask you another thing. Sure. Do you think that invisibility will ever be possible? See, the big thing about invisibility is the idea is that light passes right through you. The way we can see is because you look at the pupils of your eyes, they look black because they are absorbing all the light that falls on them. So if the light travels right through you, it travels right through your eye. How do you see it? That's the big quandary. Even H.G. Wells, he had his invisible man have his eyes, if you saw him just right, you could actually see his eyes just at the right angle because well, he understood the problem. Wells very conscious of the science in his science fiction. Absolutely, absolutely. But that's going to be the really tough one to solve. How can you have light pass through you and still be able to see? But the uh, ability to see aside, is it possible to make a human being invisible? If it is, Wells did it the right way in his original, which is he made the refractive index, the way light is bent, for the human body with the chemical treatments exactly the same as it is for air. You know how if you put a pencil in a glass of water, it seems to bend like that. Yeah. If the water had the same refractive index as air, it wouldn't bend at all. You wouldn't really detect the break. Where you wouldn't detect that there's water there. That's the idea. If you can make your body reflect, refract light exactly the way air does, you will be invisible. Okay, so it's possible, but perhaps highly unlikely. So. Sit back and relax. Don't worry, the film is called Invisible, but it will be showing up on your television screen in five, four, three. Whew! Wow, if you thought Mandroid was about as cheesy as a Romanian-made movie can get, then came Invisible. Okay, enough about the film. I'm here with science fiction writer Robert J. Sawyer talking about science in science fiction. I think we've covered most of the elements of these two films, Mandroid and Invisible, but there's still a couple we gotta get to. Sure. First one is, why is it that mad scientists are always men? 
You know, almost always the mad scientist is involved with creation of something. This is the great thing that rankles men. The power of creation belongs to women. They give life. So the whole mad scientist metaphor is about man trying to take onto himself the power to give life. And I think that's why you see it as an archetype, being the man. Uh, women, there are lots of women scientists. They're not mad, they're just angry because they get paid less. <laughs> Unfortunately, none of that thematic stuff was in this film. None at all. <laughs> but, uh, maybe it's under, underlying somewhere. But there's a couple other things I wanted to get to. Uh, one is Supercon, the uh, mystical, magical element that does all things to, you know, all people. Uh, it's a bit of a fantasy in this film, but there have been cases where newly discovered elements have seemed to be a boon in science. The first one I'm thinking about is electricity element in the idea of concept. Yes, yes, electricity. The idea that something could come into your home, power your lights, heat your food, do essentially every kind of possible work that you could imagine it was it is pure magic. And there's no denying the fact that you go right back to Frankenstein, the novel from 1812 and the movies. Electricity was imbued with these magic powers that could reanimate the dead. We thought it could do everything. It was like the aspirin of its age. It could do everything. It had healing powers uh, as well as uh, destructive powers. I mean, the electric chair, it was like the, uh, it was everything. Absolutely. I hope people. this isn't one here. No, but it yeah, is not. All right. It is not. I've tested them out. There's a wire, you know. <laughs> The other element, I'm thinking more recent one, is the uh, atomic power. Yeah. We had the atomic age, and that seemed to be the answer to all our problems, too. Absolutely, and yet it's always a genie out of the bottle kind of thing. We think, on the one hand, unlimited power means unlimited wealth, uh, no more poverty, food production is taken care of, but then there's always one mad guy who wants to take that unlimited power and blow up a city or hold the world to, to ransom. So there really is th this idea of the super element, the super con, as it was in the movie. It's very seductive. It's always been that way, though. Even you go back to the old alchemists, turning lead into gold. The gold was the super element that could do anything. Well, super con could do anything except save this film. Anyway, I'm Ido Van Valkum. Good night and pleasant dreams. <laughs>